I'm really going to focus on communication. Uh, much of what I'll say will apply to communicating anything that's complicated and kind of prismatic. There are many problems that are like the climate and energy challenge. There's nothing quite, quite as like it in terms of its scope, in terms of uh, the interconnections between energy policy and, and uh, development policy and climate policy. Um, I've been on this weird long learning journey which you can see illustrated here somewhat in some photos. This is like my 30, um, 32nd year writing about this stuff. Um, so I'm like one of those people. <laughs> There's some of us in the audience. I see people with probably some old people who are older than I am. I turned 60 this year. I, um, and, and essentially, it's all been a learning curve. Journalism ideally is a learning curve. If you get too bought into some idea that you think you understand a problem, you probably should move to a new, new beat. Because, and again, especially with something as big as humanity's great acceleration and its consequences for the environment, there's no way to get your head completely around that. It's taken 30 years, and I'm actually still learning every day. I learned a huge amount here today in meeting with I don't know how many faculty. I learned some really interesting things about the fantasy of carbon capture and, and, and sequestration at scale, at climate scale. I've learned uh, more about Bex, which I've been, this is this idea that we can not only do that, uh, but uh, put it in the, you can take biomass, burn it in a power plant, capture that CO2, put it in the ground forever at billions of tons a year scale. And uh, maybe we'll talk about that too. Um, I've learned several other things today. They'll probably reflect my reporting in the coming year. So even though I've been at this for 30 years, I always feel like I'm kind of beginning. Um, now I'm gonna, here's the cold shower part of my talk, okay? Let's, let's get real and go into the media environment we're all dealing with. We, some of you probably saw this on Twitter. Uh, it was pictured there by uh, Hillary's um, campaign photographer of a, a wonderful moment when people were going to share, they're going to be with Hillary, you know, and, and, and experience the moment of being with Hillary Clinton. And they're all facing away from Hillary Clinton. <laughs> this is the world we're in now, you know, where, where your, your screen view of the world is actually more, more real than, or meaningful to you than the real world, uh, the selfie world. So as the environment in which we communicate ideas moves increasingly into online space, there's challenges that come with that. Uh, some of you have probably read The Filter Bubble. This is what it looks like, Eli Pariser. Um, here's you, it's kind of like a cell membrane, you know, between you and the, and the world. Um, and you're blue, so pretend you're blue, okay? Whatever that is, uh, not a political color, it's just like a color. And the world is kind of, you know, every color, right? So through the media filters um, around us now, the world you see is blue. <laughs> and that, that's fine, you know, it's fine to be in a bubble as long as you know it's there. I teach communication courses at Pace University now where one of the exercises I do is to sort of force the students to reflect on how information comes to them in the course of a day. You know, like just take some fact you learned today and think back to where it came from. And they have to trace it back, like, okay, it was from Facebook, okay, or Snapchat, <laughs> more likely. A and then they have to say, well, who sent that to me? And then they have to kind of figure out, well, where did that person see it? And then and I, I ask them to trace it back to who actually wrote it or created it. And this is what we're, we're losing right now, a lot of this capacity to understand where information came from. If we, uh, at, from a very young age, we're not thinking about teaching in new ways that involve young people, right from elementary school, if not earlier, developing a new set of skills. We don't need multiple ta multiplication tables anymore because you can do that on this. But you do need to have a better sense of whether, what's true or what's real, if you want to. And of course, many of us don't want to. <laughs> which is the other reality. So that's, this is one problem. There's the, the selfie problem, there's the, um, the bubble, and then there's this, of course. So even if, even if you're interested in finding out what's real, you're buffeted with information. This is a Navy photo of a firefighting exercise on a, on a ship. And um, you know, I personally have about three of those pointed at me 24-7. There's the biodiversity one, the climate one. <laughs> The, uh, uh, the, uh, the rest of life one, you know, being a parent, being a husband, uh, and it's sort of a draining experience. And, and here's the other issue with that is um, that communication environment is in flux. It's changing. It's like 
so there's no new normal to adjust. It's not like adjusting to a new normal. It's adjusting to permanent change. My friend uh, Brad Allenby at Arizona State, who studies complex systems and stuff, and, and he says, you know, change is changing. <laughs> And that makes all of this that much more challenging. So, so as you're trying to understand the changing in physical, biogeophysical environment, you, and you're learning about it through, through this intermediary of the online communication environment, and that's changing just as much as the physical environment gets. It. And for those of us who are of the older variety, you know, we had this, we had it so easy back in the day, you know? We had someone, if you haven't heard it, I don't know if I have the, no, it's not here. Uh, Walter Cronkite, what did he used to say at the end of his broadcast? That's the way it is, Tuesday, November 2nd, blah, blah, blah. And, and, and there's no one telling us all in a common way that's the way it is anymore. And so what you have instead, it's so, and by the way, for those of us who are of that age, the, I don't know about you or you, um, but uh, you know, we used to watch the Vietnam War unfold over, over dinner. We'd be having our spaghetti, our comfort food meals. You know, my dad would be home from the furniture store, and, and we'd be arguing about the, the, uh, Nixon. And, um, but, but everyone in the country, you know, tens of millions of people were watching three people. And they were all white guys for, for most of the time. And then it became an African American and a woman and a little bit more varied. But, but it was like, we were all dining on comfort food. It's the same meal. And now it's like, now you're still dining on comfort food, but depending on what you think about climate change, you can, you're finding it at a different place. You know, it, it's, it's the ultimate buffet, uh, all night, 24 hour buffet with Indian and barbecue and sushi. And so that's depressing. This is the cold shower part. We're going to get to the there's hope part. Um, and here's the worst part. You know, all of that, all of that. So if you're, you know, most everyone here is in academia. So you have a thing, right? Your thing is next generation batteries, or your thing is the IPCC, or your thing is uh, photosynthesis. And whatever your thing is, is out there that you care about a lot, GMOs or health is immersed in this thing, which is, this is newsmap.jp. It's a really sobering website. You go there and you can sort by country or you could look at, it basically shows you in real time what the world's news outlets are showing people. And so, you know, where's climate? Where's sustainability? Is there a sustainability box there? No. And even if we weren't on the verge of this unbelievably important election, it wouldn't be there. Uh, in 2009, I was at the Copenhagen Climate Talks and I took this picture which I've shown, I probably showed here before in a different presentation on climate policy. And, and we've all ends up feeling like this guy. This was a cameraman in the press room after, you know, two weeks of, two weeks of, this, of Copenhagen will do that to you. But anyone who's trying to figure out how to be effective in that, let alone how to be effective on climate change or, or related issues, but in that media environment, you can feel really dispirited. Okay, so now, I'm going to pause, take a breath, and take you to the frontiers of, of uh, communication innovation. Um, this is a completely different arena. Whoa, sorry. There ain't no grave. Does anyone, has anyone seen this? No one? Not one? Any, somebody? No JohnnyCashProject.com. So what you're looking at is a um, four-dimensional creativity. So let me explain a little bit. Uh, Aaron Koblen, who uh, was a Google, he was at UCLA, a data visualization guy. They moved to Google, and he and some other uh, wizards of visualization a few years ago created this. And so here's the dimensions of creativity here. Well, someone wrote the song. Johnny Cash played the song, so that's two. Then there's someone shot the video, that's three. The video originally was just pictures, just images, you know, the photographic videotape. So these guys then said, let's set it up online in a, in a way that's interactive where, where you can come to the website and a video is basically a bunch of frames, right? You know, it's 26 frames a second or 60 frames a second. So it's, it's, it's a finite number of images. And, They've created a portal. You go there and you can do this and you can choose one frame out of those several thousand and you can draw on it. So you can come as a, so they've created a song. There was a song, song, videotape. You the experience, you the viewer of this. Why does that do that? You can come and become part of the creation of the art and then 
There's a fourth, there's another, so there's a fifth dimension where you can then come, so you end, end up with this like thousands of drawings. People have helped create this communal artwork. And then you can come as a, as a viewer and you can curate your own version of the video down at the bottom. If, when you go to that website, you'll see there's, you go to the actual um, widget. The, you can choose frames, all the different frames that different visitors, thousands of people who have visited are there sort of stacked be, below each spot. And you can kind of cr create your own version of the artwork to play. So that's five dimensions of creativity in one thing. Think about that in the context of conveying information about global change or anything, you can kind of engage, it's the engagement part that's novel. And, and so anytime at the New York Times when, um, you know, I look at our, we've had really cool, you know, uh, Josh Hamer, Hainer is doing these fantastic drone videos of like the Marshall Islands and stuff. Really innovative new things are happening, data visualizations. But, but this, I always remind myself like, when I think that we've crossed some cool frontier and feel ha ha, aren't we great? Um, I think to this kind of thing, and I say, we haven't even begun yet. We haven't even begun at figuring out ways to engage people. And of course, this is global. There's another one, uh, the guy, one of the musicians from the band, uh, 80s band, Depeche Mode. You know, that uh, one of the members of that band, I can't remember his name, he created this thing called Global Chorus, where anyone around the world can put on headphones and record, sing a line of harmony to a certain song. And then he takes that stuff and makes this gigantic global chorus out of it. Um, same kind of thing. You know, think about sharing. Have you seen um, the photographer George Steinmetz did this um, a week in the food life of a family? He went for Time Magazine, I think he went around the world and showed you what one week's food is for uh, sub-Saharan poor people, for, you know, suburbanites in Toronto, et cetera, et cetera. Fantastic, again, model for how to think about portraying what's going on in the world in new ways, um, and, and finding ways to do that with information related to these things is, is vital. It requires something that my, my buddy uh, Randy Olson, who some of you probably know, he calls it escaping from the nerd loop. The nerd loop is when people get into a room and talk about how to communicate. Um, that means we're in the nerd loop, you know, right now, uh, as opposed to actually doing it. Uh, it takes guts. Uh, some of you know uh, Andy Bunn at Western Washington University. Back in 2009, he emailed me that spring and said, hey, you know, I'm going to Siberia with a bunch of students, so we're doing this paleo work, and we'd love it if you would come with us and write this great feature for New York Times. But of course, it's thousands of dollars, mosquitoes the size of B-52s, and, um, and they were going anyway, and, they, and I said, well, no, I can't, I'm not going to go. But you're going with a bunch of students. You're going to be on this barge. Take pictures, you know, write things, observations, record some audio. Go around to the students and, and have them describe what you're learning. And so we created a, at that time, what I called a postcard from the Pleistocene because his work was on these, that time scale. And, and it, wasn't, it wasn't journalism. And I'm not in the field with my pad and my pens as I've been many times. It wasn't a press release. I'm curating it. I'm, you know, I'm involved in mediating what we were doing. Um, it was a novel experiment. And I, after that happened, I did more than a few of those. And then the New York Times started, they created this uh, Scientists at Work blog, which kind of doesn't exist anymore because of shrinking resources. But it was a way to sort of um, test drive that idea of getting content from scientists in the field and sharing it with people. Um, Richard Alley, you know, great scientist, pretty good guitar player, and, and he does these goofy songs about geology. Um, of course, as I say many times, he has tenure and lots of awards. So the young faculty here, I don't necessarily uh, think it's great advice to just jump online and do something goofy. Um, maybe wait till after you have tenure. Um, uh, Randy's written this good book, um, Houston. We have a narrative about storytelling advice. And I'll, I'll just very, very quickly summarize one thing he says that I think is invaluable and I talk to all my students about. And it's three letters, A, B, T. And the three letters stand for and, but, therefore. And he learned this from Trey Parker, the, one of the, producer, the creators of South Park, who in a documentary a number of years ago about South Park said, anytime you replace a, an and with a, a but or a therefore, anytime you do that, you're telling a story. 
But and, and, and is not a story. I, I went to Stanford and I gave a talk and I had dinner with some friends and I came back home. You know, where's the arc there? I went to Stanford and I gave a talk, but uh, someone challenged me really emotionally about something and I was really wrong and I suddenly figured out that something I spent my life on was a waste of time. That, that's storytelling. You know, it's not true, but, <laughs> but, but so, so, and think about that. Uh, what, is it, what, is a, what is an abstract? What is a paper? What is a research paper? Sea ice is melting, but we don't have a lot of understanding of the dynamics of how, how the ocean temperatures relate to that. Therefore, I did blah, blah, and, and I find blank. So, so it, storytelling is all around us. Figuring out how to shape that into a meaningful, whether, whether it's a talk or whether it's a actual, the, the summary of a paper or a, an article or a blog post is, is a, an opportunity. Twitter matters. Um, how many of you are on Twitter? Not a lot. Uh, of those on Twitter, how many of you really like it? Like it's, it's valuable to you? <laughs> that's good. That's, so that's a pretty high percentage. And, and can anyone just shout out a reason why? Like what is it helpful for? This <coughs> news. So news as a feed. Anything else? Conversations with people. Con conversing. Um, yeah, so this, this is... Uh, this was an invention, this thing right here. I mean, it's a pound sign or whatever the other terms are for it. But in uh, 2007, a guy um, who was living in San Diego worked at Mozilla, uh, Chris Messina, on Twitter, when it was, uh, 2007 was pretty, that's the early days. He said, hey, let's use this, why don't we use pound sign to um, have a conversation in, in this cyberspace we're in. Where, uh, so it's pound sign, uh, uh, I'm sorry, hashtag, hashtag for groups, as in pound sign bar camp. And bar camp is some programming term. I don't even know what it means. That doesn't really matter. But that, this was the first suggestion, the first use of a hashtag uh, to try to organize conversations in, in Twitter space. And it was, uh, just about in November that year, that was when the San Diego fires were happening around San Diego. And that was uh, the first operational hashtag was that in November, pound sign San Diego fire. People... We're trading information in real time about which roads were being closed off. You, you know, radio would be way behind. You, you wanted to have real time information. And then Arab Spring happens, and this happens, and that happens. And what it is, it's a way to, um, you know, there's all that noise, Justin Bieber and Trump, 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 uh, and stuff. But a hashtag allows you to have a coherent line of thinking or, or a conversation. It's global, it's either synchronous, you can have a live discussion around hashtag. Or it's asynchronous, where you can catch up with a discussion that people have had in your field. Uh, I'll, I'll talk about some examples in a minute. So through all that noise, it gives you the signal. It's like environment, environmental education. This is a fun one. I am a scientist because that kind of, there was a woman in California, a young PhD candidate, I think at Caltech, who one day took a selfie with a poster that said, I am a scientist because. And it became kind of a, a way for scientists to, to to pause and, and explain why they do what they do. And think about that in the, in the context of the ABT thing I told you about. That, you know, is it more interesting for someone to know what you do or why you do it? Which do you think is more interesting? The why, right. So curiosity, you know, it's the thing that keeps you like a child as a scientist. Uh, we're all basically children, you know, journalists are, and scientists together. Um, so, so it's a way to, and it's a way to start. Uh, go there and see what people have written uh, to kind of make that point. Uh, Pace Coral is the hashtag for uh, one of the documentaries my students made at Pace. Um, farm hack is really interesting. It's young farmers who are trying to find ways to use technology and, and uh, to make traditional farming, like small scale or, or, or organic farming, more sustainable. Weeding methods and funny little machines that can grind things. So farm hack is really cool. Bird class was Margaret Rubega, who's a, this is for the teachers in the room. Uh, years ago, she uh, was teaching, a, she teaches at University of Connecticut, a course in bird, bird biology. And uh, they had a longstanding assignment where students had to keep a journal of bird behavior, just as, as they observed it. And she switched to Twitter. They had to start tweeting about bird behavior, which is kind of implicitly funny. Um, but, but she found that, she, and she's written the, about this in, in journal, uh, she found that they were way more engaged with keeping track of bird behavior when it was through this thing that they're already 
living through. So rather than banishing it, um, it's part of, it becomes an organic part of how they're learning. And not only how they're learning, they're sharing their learning because Twitter is an open medium. And so, and it's become now a portal. That hashtag, if you go there, half the time, the, half the time the things that have been posted to that tag are someone in Arizona, you know, who saw a bird and wanted to know what it was because they know there's a bunch of birders who, who are at that, at that place, you know, that, that place. Again, it, to me, it reminds me in, of the uh, Harry Potter movies at the port key. This is, a, you latch, you hold on to it, and you all go to this place. Um, the best way to start, this is like a little four minute Twitter primer, is to follow people. You don't have to tweet, remember? You can test drive it, you can turn it off when you don't wanna have it take over your life. And here's some, uh, someone, who, well here's a, he's actually very active on Twitter too, but YouTube, uh, Google Hangouts are a way for a university scientist to say, hey, this is what I do. It's like an open house, but it doesn't, you don't have to uh, put out cookies and, 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 um, and wine. And here's some very, very useful touchstones on climate, uh, climate change science, uh, Gavin Schmidt. Catherine Hayhoe, who just did that thing at the White House with uh, Leonardo DiCaprio and the president. And Richard Betts, he's at the Met Office uh, in, in the UK. He has a government position, but he's actively engaged on Twitter as, as a way to sort of help people sift what's real or not. So, so it, to me, it's, it's a not the responsibility of every scientist, but it is the responsibility of every institution of science to be engaged in these areas, um, to be out there, to be helping people sift for what's real so that we're not all suffused with that noise. And, and any, anytime you can help cut through that, you're doing, you're doing a public service. Um, there are, um, and you think about journalism shrinking, that's left an opportunity for a lot of um, institutions of learning and research to fill that space. This is just a few examples. Yale E360. Um, Earth Institute at Columbia, Pace University, our, our blog, separate from what I do at the Times, uh, University of Minnesota, uh, they're magazines. They're basically, they're out there. Remember, search engines don't care if it's in the New York Times or, or, or something like this. If you do good SEO, good search engine optimization in your website, then, then that, and I've had this happen where, um, oh, I'll give you an example. Um, the conversation, is anyone here posting on the conversation? Good, 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 good. It's a really interesting, it's kind of like an op-ed page for everybody, for anybody with some kind of academic expertise or scholarly understanding. It was started by an Australian journalist or two and now it's a global platform for writing commentary, mostly on current events or if you have a paper coming out. And so one day, let's see, what was this? It was several years ago on Facebook in my flow, there was this unbelievably dramatic photograph of a uh, volcano erupting in Papua New Guinea. And it was so stark. And I write a lot about disaster risk reduction, not just climate. And um, so I wanted to find out what was going on. So I'm Googling around. And I found this guy. He, was a, he may be out now. He was a doctoral candidate at uh, University College London who had written a really great explainer about this volcano and that particular area of New Guinea. And I ended up excerpting it on my blog and uh, you know, quoting him because, because he was really insightful and a good writer. And, and I never would have known, who would ever have known of Robin Wiley? Maybe someone in the room knows him. <laughs> but but he, uh, because he, he, he's out there, he put himself out there in a way that was useful. And you think, well, yeah, this is all great, but what about, you know, as journalism shrinks, what about investigative journalism? What about the hard stuff, which is really a problem right now? And um, there are, nonprofit entities that have risen up to fill some of that gap, that part of the communication sphere. One is Inside Climate News. They won a Pulitzer Prize, Pulitzer Prize for pipeline reporting several years ago in the Midwest. They did all that Exxon New uh, reporting. So there's a model, there are models that are emerging that are not the conventional newspaper model and that can get a lot of attention even without that. I'm gonna talk about DIY. The do-it-yourself factor is so much, there's so much more you can do now as an individual. If you have some GIS skills, if you have skills that I don't have, like how to turn data into a, a map, how to map data. But uh, in uh, Pennsylvania, several, a number of, well, I guess it was around 2000, 
2009 or so, a young guy who worked in the state legislature, he was not, you know, he was a low level guy uh, who knew there were a lot of data out related to uh, fracking, where the wells are, um, um, whether there were violations. The data were all there in government, you know, websites somewhere. But he spent a couple of days, and in a couple of days he created a, a, um, a clickable database like this. So you can go there, you know, if you're moving to this community or you live near here and there's something weird smell in the air, you now, because of this guy, have way more access to data, that data than you might have had before. And it was just one person who did that. It just yes, today, was it today or yesterday? I just, I just posted on this um, cartographer from University of Wisconsin. Um, his blog is northlandia.com, Carl Sack. He's really upset about the, the Dakota Access Pipeline. And he thinks that, and I agree with him, that not, a lot, not enough attention is being paid to the historic treaty issues that underlie the thing that most of the people in the room are more focused on, which is the, the, the implications for oil, oil and gas. And so I did a piece, I, he created a map. And he said, he quoted a, 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 um, someone who had influenced him greatly, whose name I'm blanking on right now, but the guy said, the, the, the side with the best map wins. And, and he had noticed that there wasn't really a good map of the situation with that historical context, uh, meaning where the land was. This is all Sioux land. Um, their reservation is only part of the land that they were granted under a treaty. And, uh, and to me, that really needs to be hammered. Uh, so, so it's another example I think that's really kind of exciting. Get your skills. You have skills. Use them. Find, find partners to build things if you don't know how to do everything. Learning in the class, you know, learning and doing. Six years ago when I started at Pace, they had an annual documentary course where students on their spring break would go somewhere and make a film, which is great. Um, a lot of the films were like travel sites in Italy and, you know, they were just films about things. The, uh, the Day in the Life of the, the U.S. Ambassador to the Netherlands. It won, a, it won an award. I mean, it's fine. It's good. Good stuff. But I joined, uh, someone said, hey, you should meet Maria Lesquet, to me, the professor, communication professor. And we started brainstorming, and I thought, well, you know, God, I've got this backlog of stories I've been wanting to do for so many years. And the first one was, uh, there was an American woman who had moved to Belize in uh, the 80s, and she was dead set on coming up with a more sustainable model of shrimp farming, um, Linda Thornton. And so... I, I, got, I did some reporting. We, that was the film we made that year, the first year. And then since then, we've been to Cuba, Portugal to look at the forests, the issues with cork forests, and um, long story there, but interesting one. Um, sea turtle conservation in, in Baja. And the students, these are students who are, mostly will go into careers in corporate communications or maybe at um, um, CNBC or that kind of thing. But in part, and these are in their learning, they're not, they're not environmental studies students, most of them. They were communication students. But by, in this course, they learned that poverty, that, that in a poor community in Mexico, if you're not considering those fishermen's livelihoods, they're not going to stop fishing, even if it's going to drown some turtles. They learned these, these fundamental challenges that we face in sustainability, which are so often about those kinds of trade-offs. And, and that sticks with them. And I think that's kind of fantastic. So. Um, it's been a great thing. We went to Cuba this year. We were there the year, uh, uh, the, the week that Obama and the Rolling Stones were there. <laughs> and we went to the Stones show. It was, it's in the film. Cuba's Crossroads. Um, at Pace University, we did a, actually, uh, Mark Jacobson participated in a Google Hangout with us about um, energy futures for New York. You know, this is that 100% his template for looking at state energy transitions. Uh, and so we were like learning and doing at the same time. There's many ways to do that. And then, of course, that spills into dot earth. So it's kind of like a multiple thing. Facebook can actually matter. This is uh, one of my favorite Facebook items that a student of mine from, who's a Turkish uh, journalist, he pointed to it on his Tumblr account one day. And for those in the back of the room, it, I'll just explain. It, it's, uh, it was created by this young student in Nova Scotia, Isaac Freshia as a school project. And what it is, it looks like a conversation on Facebook. It actually reads like a conversation on Facebook. But you get into it, you know, tiger, totally screwed, like 3,200 of me left, sad, you know, sad face. And Panda, oh yeah, you know, he likes this. But then of course Panda immediately realizes that could be misinterpreted. 
And it says, I don't mean like, like good. I, I mean like, like I feel you, bro. I'm around 2,500 now. Marine turtle, you know, rhino, mountain gorilla. Uh, so it's a conversation, and it ends with human, point taken, guys. And, and that's fine. You know, that's funny. You, you've seen a lot of funny things like that. But it was linked to a World Wildlife Fund um, um, sort of learn more thing. Um, and so, and who knows whether there was a measurable diversion of business as usual trajectories on conservation as a result. But to me, certainly, I can't th imagine that this would have at least gone in the negative direction. The fact that he was creating artwork in, in Halifax, Nova Scotia, you know, not, not like at the School of Visual Arts in New York City or someplace, and could have that become a meaningful part of the sustainability conversation related to species con conservation is really great. But I, I think the single best, the single most exciting education initiative I've seen in years came, it was in the Bronx. I, um, one day at a talk, I, uh, my wife, who's an environmental educator, a couple of decades ago, she had mentioned to me once, she had a, someone at, at the city, uh, at um, the, um, what's it called, Bank Street School, where she worked briefly, had mentioned that they used to do a uh, field trip to the boiler room in their school as a, as a learning experience. And so I was at a meeting in San Francisco, actually, the Verge meeting a few years ago, and I kind of blurted out, hey, man, we should all do, we should all do field trips to the boiler room. You know, there's no, bud you don't have to get permission slips. You don't have to rent a bus, um, any school. And, and then someone emailed me from this uh, uh, Solar One. It's a, in New York City, a nonprofit group that does curricula elements related to energy. And, and um, they said, we're doing, we do that. We do that at the school in the Bronx. It's the High School of Energy and Technology. And I could go into a long, there's a fantastic backstory behind how the school got created. It's a public high school designed to fill an employment, an employment gap in New York City. New York City has gotten, they had gotten a grant to do a big retrofit of their school buildings. And remember, in New York City in the 90s, as late as like the mid-90s, New York City schools were still uh, coal, coal shoveled furnaces to keep them heat, heated. So there's a lot of ret retrofitting that has to be done. Uh, they had a grant, a federal grant, but then they went to the union and the union said, oh, we don't have enough people to run those new systems, you know, those cool new smart meters and things. And, and the woman who ran the city's sustainability part of the school system, she worked out, the hey, let's turn this school in the Bronx into a school for energy and technology. And, and one of the things they do is a boiler room tour. The custodian is their lecturer for the day. Just that alone just that alone is an amazing thing to think about. And, uh, and they learn about their school as a system. How many people in this room are like passionate about systems, right? Systems thinking. How many times do you hear systems thinking, systems thinking? But how many times do you see it taught in a way that's like this, where it's just visceral and simple, and this is how much oil we burn and blah, blah, blah. Um, fantastic. And that can be done in any school. And it's not a matter of anything except sharing information. That's all it takes. Um, so uh, that makes me hopeful that we can build from the ground up a lot of potential. I'm going to speed through some things just since we have time to talk. You all know about visualizations. You know, I can tell you the volume of the atmosphere, <laughs> you know, how many cubic kilometers it is, or I can show you. Uh, Adam Neiman has done this beautifully. Uh, over the years, others have tried this. He's a British science illustrator. Uh, that's the volume of all the world's liquid fresh water. And a great homework assignment is, OK, kids, draw the volume of all the world's uh, usable fresh water, meaning accessible. And uh, that's actually all, that's, that's all the world's water, all the oceans. So say, how much, uh, how much is fresh? You, that's a known volume, so you could draw that sphere. How much is potable? <laughs> you know, you can't even see it. So there's lots of opportunities there. And I was talking to a um, um, couple of people here about the right, the right wavelengths for the right job. You know, this is a beautiful sunny day in Colorado. 2009, I started writing about methane leaks in oil and gas facilities. Um, and this is the same thing with an infrared camera. This, this has kind of, kind of become old now. So it's a beautiful sunny day in Colorado. <laughs> but if you wanted to convince people that, that the Obama administration needs to tighten its regulations on oil and gas facilities, which, which wavelength would you choose? I, and then if you remember the Aliso Canyon disaster, uh, EDF, Environmental Defense Fund, th with uh, another environmental group that has uh, aviation capacity, if they hadn't used infrared cameras to show these, the effect of that Aliso Canyon 
eruption, it would have taken a lot longer, I guarantee you, for that issue to be resolved. And this isn't all about like tamping down bad behavior. It, there are opportunities that can arise using these technologies as well. Last year, I was at this meeting in Paris in July. It was a science meeting, climate science and policy meeting ahead of the, the big uh, shindig. And a woman from Plymouth University in England presented a paper um, where they did this really interesting study uh, using infrared camera images of houses and showing you the waste heat that, you know, the houses or an old house leaks a lot of heat, a lot, you're losing energy. Basically, they, they did a, a test through a course of a year where they had two or three different versions of the brochure, informational brochure on how to save energy with your house. And one of them had, was just the information. One of them was the information with a picture of a glowing house. And one of them was an information with a picture of your house. And then they followed up, you know, which got the same information. And of course, the one with your house got way more buy-in. Um, and that's, to me, a very interesting demonstration of how thinking about how people receive or, uh, or don't receive information is an important thing. Yep. Yeah, 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 sure. I'm sorry if I'm running long. Uh, th this, is an info this is an infographic. It's data turned into, inf into visuals. It's a, on the benefits of public transportation. It was originally a bunch of still images from Toronto city government on, on the values of a trolley system there. And a young guy in Texas a few years ago put it on Tumblr as an animated GIF. And you know, again, it's just information. It's the same number of people in different transportation circumstances. And again, I, I, I think about the New York Times or anyone else, and I think this is circling more toward what I was showing you that in the beginning with um, our friends, um, the Johnny Cash Project. So that, that, that'll do for now. I can go on, but I wanted to be sure we had a, little, a couple minutes to talk. I thank you very much. Get on Twitter. <laughs> Try it. <laughs> uh, thanks very much, Andy. That was a tour de force and a, a very broad uh, run through a lot of different uh, things that thank I think you. will be extremely important. We're, we're counting on you to figure out exactly in what way they will become important over the next five years. I, actually, I meant that seriously. You could think of doing a systems analysis of everything you presented. Maybe somebody here will yeah, be smart true. enough to do that. Certainly not me. Uh, <laughs> why don't we take maybe three quick questions and then move to the energy so social, if that's OK with you? Okay. Uh, OK, we usually start with student questions. Any student questions? Looks like Emma Hutchinson. Hi, thank you so much for your talk. I just wanted to hear if you had any advice for young people entering the climate communication space, given that there's all these changes to journalism. Yeah, well, I, I guess what I would recommend is, depending on your issue, or your uh, find someone like Climate of Gavin or Catherine Hayhoe, Kath, Catherine Hayhoe, study them. Uh, you know, watch them, track their output, see how they engage people in Facebook. Yeah, Catherine's very active I on Facebook. Her, remember, her, she's a Texan, and uh, she's surrounded by people with all kinds of feelings about climate and energy. And, uh, but she engages in a very, a very um, respectful way, a very open way, listening. So, so find good find pra practitioners and just get used to what they're doing. And then maybe do a little test drive. You know, See if you can start to build your own little network. Uh, Jacqueline Gill, who's the University of Maine paleo ecologist, um, I just started this, uh, Eric Holthouse, a uh, uh, blogging meteorologist, uh, sent a note around a year ago to a bunch of us climate people, communicators, and said, let's, we need to like, get together once a week. Let's do something, you know, just talk, chat. And, and then someone said, well, we should do a podcast. And so Jacqueline is part of this podcast. It's Eric, me, and Jacqueline. It's called Our Warm, Our Warm Regards. And I'm just using it as like a way to get used to what's podcasting. It is highly imperfect, uh, but you know it's we're learning and and it's actually working. People are listening, so so get just try it, try it. You'll like it. <laughs> okay, in the back. Any non-student questions? Okay, let's do this one and then that one, and then we'll probably break. So that just last thing time. about the uh, value of the thermal image of your house gets more. Um, so could you see getting involved in, in creating a knowledge base where we're looking at the picture of the land that somebody lives on? They're able to put into the knowledge base, this is what's going on in my land. And then 
ideally, if there's a problem, you get communities of science and communities on the ground working together to solve the problem on the basis of their common interest in that ecosystem. Yeah. Well, there are people, I just, was it Adam Sobel, someone I was just talking to, um, we're talking about how to refine a picture of agriculture, productivity, you know, from uh, remote sensing. I think that we're just at the beginning of thinking about how to do lots of these things. Um, at EASA in um, Austria, they are doing a, there's something called GeoWiki, where they have a huge amount of lands of satellite data of land use change. But apparently satellites are still, sometimes they conflict, like a European, an ESA satellite and a NASA satellite will look at the same pixel and think it was deforestation or, or it's water or not. And so they're, they're using the community, a bunch of eyeballs to sort of get some clarity through that. Uh, there's many, many, many ways that this can play out, I think. Final question back here in the green shirt. You mentioned uh, the bubble problem and yeah. you didn't really address, I don't think, any solutions to that because it seems like all these Twitter things just concentrate ideas. And, yeah, well, it's. It, and then I, when there's conflict, it blows up and all that. Yeah, well, to me, it's about intentionality. You know, and this is the hardest thing, but you have to. The reason I mentioned like elementary school education, that it's a new skill set we that's needed in terms of how to think about the web, how to think about what you're seeing. The Pope actually in his encyclical had a little section, I could show you another slide about where he said, you know, how do we use this stuff usefully? Uh, so, but you have to have an intention. Uh, I guarantee you that the, the bubble will win unless you develop, it's like uh, Dan Kahneman's book about thinking fast and slow. Thinking slow is basically stopping and thinking about how you're thinking. And if we don't develop that skill, and this relates to all the Trumpy, you know, all this intensity is about not stepping back from your own thought processes and, and letting your feelings dominate, then we're in trouble. Did I see one more question on the left hand side? Yeah, I was just wondering if you could comment on how you've seen the increasing polarization in the US reflect on reporting in your community and with, with respect to the environment, et cetera. Well, if, if I had had time to fix my presentation a little more, there was a video shot last year in, um, I mentioned earlier in the day to some students um, in Woodward County, Oklahoma, which according to a Yale survey was the most skeptical county in America on global warming. And, and there, it's mostly oil and gas you know, families. And, and it's a three minute video, it's on Dot Earth. You just search for like Woodward, Oklahoma, Revkin, CNN, you'd find it. Um, and, the, and these people, the first minute and a half, they all are just like you would think. You know, this, this older lady says, oh, out here, you know, Al Gore's name is a cuss word. So it's like that. And then halfway through, uh, it shifts to discussion about energy. And even the guy who's like the ultimate like, pocket protector, oil and gas guy who thinks God controls the climate, he says that in the, his, he says, you know, we got half of our roof is covered with solar panels and we're going to do the, next, the rest of it because we want to get off the grid entirely. Now, his reasoning has nothing to do with any... Nothing to do with global warming, and he'll fight you forever on global warming. And, and, it, and his reasoning was not about like, you know, the um, George Schultz kind of security, you know, it's, we don't have to buy oil. It was about independence. He doesn't want to have to pay a utility when he can do it himself. So, so you can, if you want to build a broader uh, impetus in divided America around climate progress, the, often this thing to do is not talk about climate. And it's not like a cop out. I mean, unless you, you know, maybe it is a cop out to some people, but, but if it's the way to develop a common conversation on a solution that everyone thinks makes sense for some reason or other, and, and this is the same, the, the Yale survey shows the, that high, there's no red and blue states, no red and blue states on uh, increased research in uh, renewable R&D, like renewable energy R&D. Uh, regulating CO2 as a pollutant, it's not red and blue. It's all the kind of yes, and because people have an ethical understanding of pollution is a, is a bad. So it's like, but then, so that means a lot of environmental groups who are all climate, 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 you know, have some work to do. Great. Uh, I'll remind you uh, and invite you to the uh, energy social outside for the next 56 and a half minutes. And finally, thank Andy one last time. <laughs>